Hello there, just before we get into today's video, why not check out a new channel from me called War of Graphics? Want to know all the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics. From Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa, if it's got people fighting each other, we'll cover it. There is a link below. I hope to see you over there. And now, today's video. Football is undoubtedly one of the most beloved sports around the world. And for American viewers who associate football with big shoulder pads and helmets, we actually mean soccer, where the ball is, well, it's a ball. And the main medium with which it is played are the feet. For more on how soccer got that name, stick around for the bonus facts at the end. But for now, we're not going to stick on this etymological issue of how the sport is named. We're definitely not going to war over football. But who would? Well, that would be El Salvador and Honduras in 1969. Well, in truth, the whole event was much more complicated than a single set of football matches, but this didn't stop the war from being dubbed the Football War. So what actually happened? In 1961, a little-known, extremely obscure, and largely forgotten footnote in history called the Cuban Missile Crisis happens. While little is known about the event today or what led up to it after weeks of research, as far as we can dig up, we think it had something to do with, perhaps, cigars. Whatever the case, after the success of Charles Xavier in ensuring Cuban cigars would still be available to most of the world, the area remains the focus of the Cold War, despite being decidedly tropical. In this environment, Oswaldo Lopez Arellano overthrew the Honduran government, becoming a dictator in 1963. Neighboring countries such as Mexico and the United States under Kennedy by removing embassies and ceasing military cooperation. But soon under the looming shadow of various threats linked with Cuba, the the US government under Lyndon B. Johnson recognized the new government. Besides, among other things, the new dictator had done his part to soothe his relationship with the US by introducing and establishing agrarian reforms that benefited major banana companies. Yes, the quickest way to assure global peace is, as ever, big businesses all depending on their revenues and supply chains from all corners of the globe to just keep on keeping on. The main backlash from this was, of course, that the farmers were not exactly happy about their bananas being given to foreigners so cheaply. To help endear the people to him more, their dear dictator organized free elections in 1965, and that convinced absolutely nobody. And now into the picture of the conflict with El Salvador. The Machiavellian plan of Ariano was to accuse his neighbors of his own misdeeds. El Salvador is a country enjoying the breeze of the Pacific Ocean. Although theoretically rich and blessed, it was after all named to honor Jesus the Savior or Salvador in Spanish, the country had an overpopulation problem. If one were to compare Honduras and El Salvador, El Salvador would come out much smaller, but at the same time in the 1960s, it was far more densely populated than its neighbor. So, in previous decades, egged on by the landowning elite, a quiet wave of immigrant farmers had begun using and farming land in Honduras. Their number, estimated at around 300,000, constituted a fifth of the total Honduran population. It was at this point that the dictator went Propaganda 101 on the people and tried to solve his problems by finding a scapegoat to all of the country's ills. Taking a page out of the book of basically every political leader ever, he chose to blame the foreigners living and working on Honduran soil because of of course he did. And so it was that the land reform implemented in 1967 redistributed land used by the immigrants to Hondurans. Often, however, these lands belonged to people who had been living there for decades and who in some cases had integrated with Honduran families by marriage. Despite this, many Hondurans did not care and supported by the government propaganda, they took matters into their own hands, which inevitably led to many, many human rights violations and major suffering on the immigrants' parts. Humans, we are just the worst. While the dictator was happy, his neighbors weren't, with El Salvador demanding official intervention from the Honduran government to resolve the issue and protect its people on Honduran soil. Beyond ethical factors, the smaller country was also not prepared to receive hundreds of thousands of immigrants given the boot or fleeing Honduras for their safety. And so, this brings us to football. From 12 countries of Central and North America, there was only one ticket for the 1970 World Cup Finals. The winners of the four groups of the first round would play off against each other. The winners of Group 1 and 2 were the USA and Haiti. The winners of Group 3 and 4 were Honduras and El Salvador, respectively. They would play three matches against each other, and the first to have two victories would qualify. The first match was played in the capital of Honduras on June the 8th, 
1969. The night before, the match was marked with street violence and clashes between supporters of the two teams. Some of the violence even occurred near the hotel where the team of El Salvador was staying, and many were targeted. In the match, Honduras won in the most football of football ways, a show-stopping 1-0. The week after, on the 15th of June, the two teams met again in San Salvador. The Salvadorians were not in the mood for a warm welcome, and vengeful chaos and violence was observed in the streets. In this hostile environment, the Honduran team, probably fearing for their lives, lost 3-0, with one Honduran team member noticing it was a very good thing that they ended up losing. This defeat, in turn, aggravated the Hondurans back at home so much that reportedly 11,000 El Salvadorians were expelled from Honduras in the 10 days between the second and the final match. How this compared to normal numbers isn't clear as far as we can find, but one thing for sure was the Salvadorian media wasn't shy about pointing these numbers out at the time. On the day of this tiebreaker match, El Salvador broke relations with Honduras in protest of the Honduran government, which did little to stop the violence. In this hellish atmosphere, the third match was thankfully played in the neutral stadium of Mexico City, under guard of nearly 2,000 Mexican police stationed to attempt to keep the peace. All the while, reportedly, Salvadorians were chanting murderers at the counterparts. And it was a nail-biter. El Salvador took the lead in the eighth minute with a goal, only for Honduras to score ten minutes later. But El Salvador scored again in the 28th minute. The second half was calmer, with the only goal being scored by Honduras. The match ended in another very football way to all. So yes, the best possible outcome in the whole situation was the need for overtime. In the 103rd minute, El Salvador scored, giving them the ticket to the next round and disqualifying the Hondurans. Tensions continued to mount between the two countries following the match, with the outcome used by both sides as propaganda. As noted by Polish journalist Ryszard Kapuscinski, who was in the region covering events in the aftermath, he reported seeing graffiti around saying things like, nobody beats Honduras, which was very clearly false. Journalist Ricardo Otero succinctly summed up the situation. There were much bigger political matters, but there was this coincidence of three games to qualify for the 1970 World Cup. It didn't help. Football here is very, very passionate for good and for bad. Within a couple of weeks of political back and forth, continued violence against the immigrant populace and occasional skirmishes finally escalated to open war, and on July the 14th, 1969, major military action began, with El Salvador utilizing their air force to invade. Of course, in the absence of proper bombers, they instead used passenger planes with explosives strapped to their sides. They managed to incapacitate the Honduran Air Force for a while by targeting the airports and thus gaining the initiative in the military action. Additionally, they began a land invasion, almost making it to the capital. However, their advantage did not last long as the Nicaraguan dictator came to the Honduran's aid with provisions and their air force struck back. By morning of July the 16th, the bombers were attacking both El Salvadorian air bases and, more devastatingly, oil depots along the coast. The Honduran government also got the Organization of American States, OAS, involved. Overall, the war was not a long one. In fact, it was so brief beyond being called the Football War, it also bears the moniker the 100-Hour War. On July the 18th, after an emergency session, the OAS called for a ceasefire and for the El Salvadorian invasion to stop immediately. While the ceasefire was put into effect by July the 20th, El Salvador would not withdraw its forces completely from near the Honduran capital until August the 2nd, demanding reparations be paid and protection be granted to Salvadorian immigrants living in Honduras. In the aftermath, continued pressure enacted by the OAS ended the conflict for good, and though peace was still more than a decade away, a treaty only being signed on October 30, 1980, the active threat ceased with the El Salvadorian troops returning to their country. In the meantime, the OAS kept a closer eye on how the immigrants in Honduras were treated, and the Honduran government also agreed to stop their persecution of said individuals. As for other consequences, Honduras lost 250 soldiers and over 2,000 civilians, additionally suffering a surge of homelessness as the fighting had caused significant destruction on Honduran soil. On the other side, 900 Salvadorians died. Even worse, however, was the fact that the conflict caused over 300,000 Salvadorans to flee Honduras, with most of them attempting to return to the native country, which was economically and socially unable to accept this many newcomers at once. Overpopulation and poverty surged, helping to lay the foundation for the military's increased power, counteracting previous democratic movements, as well as ultimately leading to the Salvadorian Civil War, raging from 1979 to 1992. Furthermore, both economies plummeted as trade between the two countries ceased and the border was closed. And despite the peace treaty and several attempts to sort out territory disputes, the countries remain at odds even today. As for the football aspect, El Salvador also won against Haiti and in doing so qualified for the World Cup. Unfortunately for them, three defeats in three matches saw their country's World Cup dreams dashed, losing 3-0 to Belgium, 4-0 to Mexico City, and 2-0 to the Soviet Union, not even scoring a single goal. And now for a bonus fact. 
For all of you out there who love to complain when Americans and certain others call football soccer, you should know that it was the British that invented the word, and it was also one of the first names for what we know now as football. In fact, in the early days of the sport among the upper echelons of British society, the proper word for the sport was soccer. Not only that, but the sport being referred to as soccer preceded the first recorded instances of it being called the singular word football by about 18 years, with the latter happening when it became more popular with the middle and lower classes. When that happened, the term football gradually began dominating over soccer and then the official name Association Football. As to why the need for a less generic name than football, it turns out in the 1860s, as in most of history, with records as far back as 1004 BC, there were quite a lot of football sports in existence being played popularly throughout the world and, of course, in England. Many of these sports had similar rules, and eventually, on October 26, 1863, a group of teams in England decided to get together and create a standard set of rules which would be used at all their matches. They formed the rules for association football, with the association distinguishing it from the many other types of football sports in existence in England, such as rugby football. British schoolboys of the day liked to nickname everything. They also liked to add er uh, to these nicknames. Rugby was, at the time, popularly called rugger. Association football was then much better known as a soccer, which was then shortened to soccer and sometimes soccer football. In the beginning, the newly standardized rugby and soccer were football sports for gentlemen, primarily being played by the upper echelon of society. However, these two forms of football gradually spread to the masses, particularly soccer, as rugby didn't really catch on too well with the lower classes. This resulted in the name switching from soccer and association football to just football, with the first documented case of the sport being called by the singular term football coming in 1881, 18 years after it was first called soccer or officially association football. The game gradually spread throughout the world under the lower class name of football rather than soccer as the gentleman called it. The problem was though that a lot of other countries of the world already had popular sports of their own. They called football such as the United States, Canada, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa to name just a few. In these countries the name soccer was and in some cases still is preferred for this reason. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.